I work for the EU Red Facility, which is uh, an EU-funded program uh, supporting uh, land use reform and Red Plus processes in a few countries uh, with a specific focus in the Congo Basin, which will also uh, be what I will be talking to you about uh, today. Um, so this is more sort of a, a feedback of experience of our work there. We're not a research institution. We're, we're a technical uh, support institution and facilitator in, in, in those countries. Um, I'll just uh, give you a, a bit of a context um, of some of the, the, the um, general features of benefit sharing uh, arrangements uh, in, in the Congo Basin. And then I'll give you some more detailed example uh, specific to two countries uh, that, um, that, uh, that we work in. Uh, that's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, and the Republic of Congo. So two, two neighboring countries which are uh, sharing quite a lot of challenges in that respect. And from that I'll try to, to draw some, some early lessons. So some, some elements of context. Um, I think to start with it's important to say that benefit sharing is not, is not a new topic uh, in, in those countries. There's already quite a lot of experiences. Um, in different sectors, forest sector, in conservation, uh, in mining, uh, oil and gas, uh, etc. Um, but without doubt, um, the forest sector is a sector where there's, uh, there's been uh, much more experience uh, as regards benefit sharing uh, arrangements. And it, that's also why it's been most documented. Um, one general feature of the benefit sharing arrangements that, uh, that we've been uh, looking at is that um, they're usually seen as a compensation, compensation mechanism rather than payment, uh, payments for, for any type of, uh, of performance or, or results. So they're seen as compensation for the limitation to the access uh, of, uh, of, uh, to national resources uh, of, of different groups of stakeholders but uh, generally, generally local communities. And in that sense, um, the benefits that are being shared do not at all reflect the actual costs um, uh, that are incurring to the different stakeholders, but rather um, they can be seen as a form of um, taxation, maybe, of some, some of the, the stakeholders that are, get the privileged access to national resources. Um, and sometimes they're also framed um, by certain um, market standards or, or CSR. Um, objectives, but there's a, there's a huge range of, uh, of, of different uh, incentives really for, for those who are, who are sharing benefits. Um, in the two countries that we work in, there's, uh, there are some legal provisions that are framing uh, the, the, the sharing of, of those benefits, but uh, they're not always com comprehensive and, and more importantly than the, the actual implementation provisions um, are, are very often missing. Um, there's been a renewed attention uh, lately on, on, on benefit sharing in the context of uh, well, the, the recent uh, Red Plus development and the, and the move towards uh, the investment phase of Red Plus uh, throughout the development of, uh, of national Red Plus strategies but also um, emission reduction programs. And the two countries I'm, I'm talking about, uh, DRC and Republic of Congo, are both developing um, jurisdictional emission reduction program uh, at the moment. On the, gen on the general international um, framework, um, there's very li limited information coming from either the UNFCCC or the UNRED or the FIP or even the, FC the general FCPF uh, provisions. Um, and benefit sharing is not a very strong uh, component of voluntary standards either, apart from some exceptions. Um, and it is really the methodological framework of the FCPF carbon fund um, that is serving as, uh, as, as the guidance for, 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 for those countries and for, for those uh, mechanisms to be designed at the moment. Um, there's two important provisions um, within the, the methodolog methodological framework, the, which uh, dates from uh, December 2013, so it's also quite, uh, quite recent provisions. Uh, one is on the, ne the necessity to have a benefit um, sharing plan and, and design benefit sharing arrangements in a transparent and participative way um, and also in, in a way that acknowledges the existing regulatory framework. Um, and the second provision um, uh, puts the emphasis on, on the inclusion and the monitoring of non-carbon benefits within, within the schemes.
One common uh, bottleneck that we encounter when we, when we discuss these issues in, 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 uh, in the Congo Basin, and, and, and I'm sure that bottleneck is, is shared with many other countries, is, uh, is, the, is the issue of carbon rights. And, and there is something very important that we're trying to, message very important that we're trying to, 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 to pass along, is that uh, we need to decouple the, um, um, the red plus issue from, from tenure issue in that sense. Um, if, if, we get in, if we stay stuck um, uh, thinking um, that we need a framework and we need a red plus law looking at allo allocating carbon rights, uh, we'll, we'll move very, very, very slowly because we're not there in terms of policy development in those countries. So the idea is really rather to, rather to looking at who um, owns the carbon is who actually contributes to the carbon sequestration and to the emission reductions. And uh, as was uh, very nicely explained uh, uh, by Ashwin earlier, um, in the absence of that um, legal framework, uh, there's been, generally speaking, only ad hoc uh, arrangements that, been, that have been, uh, that have been um, discussed and, and, uh, and, uh, and decided between, between stakeholders in the form of, uh, of contracts. Um, so that can potentially be, present quite a, a, an important equity risk because these arrangements uh, greatly, greatly differ and, and are not framed at the moment by any uh, general guidelines uh, or safeguards at, uh, at national level. In the Congo Basin, there's mainly two options that are currently being discussed as regards um, the, this issue of, uh, of, of carbon rights. One is uh, looking at carbon uh, as a um, uh, natural resource, and uh, a natural resource in the Congo Basin are owned by the state government. So the carbon reductions would be the property of the, uh, of the government and of the state. Uh, another option is to see the, the emission reductions as, a, as an environmental services um, for which uh, those specific stakeholders uh, who have uh, invested uh, would be um, earning the rights. So these, op these options are still um, at the moment discussed and debated. In, in, the, in the countries we work in. Another key issue is, okay, what, what is it actually that, we, that, we, uh, that we're sharing? I'm not gonna go back to the definition of benefits because it's been very nicely covered earlier, um, but I think we need to um, keep in mind that there are many costs that need to be covered. Um, there's the cost of compensation of the, op the opportunity of, uh, of the stakeholders that are changing um, their um, land use, um, the land, the land users, you have, you have all the costs and that are linked to the actual program or project implementation, and these costs are not uh, negligible. They're really, they're really important. Uh, the transaction costs, the implementation costs, the MRV, uh, the potential certification costs, and also the costs of all these impl implementing and enabling activities that, uh, that support the general um, uh, credibility of, uh, of, of those projects. You also have to pay back your investors, and, and when all that is done, um, what's left? Well, there's, there could be a bit of carbon rent left, and that could be further distributed, but that's, that's only really the case if a certain, a certain uh, amount of conditions are met, uh, and which are currently an issue. So that's, the, the conditions are obviously that these costs are, are uh, as low as possible, but also that you get a, a good uh, um, emission reduction uh, objectives and uh, a decent carbon price um, to cover all this. So in DRC, um, there's been discussion um, uh, with regard to the development of a jurisdictional uh, program which in the region of Maindombe. So Maindombe is a, is a, covers about 5% uh, of, the, of, the, of the countries and uh, and 12.3 uh, million hectares of, um, of forests. And it's the, this, project, this program is currently in the pipeline of the FCPF Carbon Fund. It's quite a complex uh, project because uh, it involves more than 20 partners, uh, and there's already existing Red Plus project um, that need to be docked in this jurisdictional program. Um, and one key feature as well is, that, um, is the stratification of objectives. Because this, this area is, uh, is so complex and there are, so, there are different land uses uh, and different types of, uh, of forests, there are specific objectives that are being uh, spelled out for these different land uses. 
and different reference levels will be set according um, to these land uses, and this has strong implications for the distribution of benefits. In the ERPIN, so the project idea note of, uh, of that program, there's already been a number of principles that have been agreed on, on the benefit sharing. These are quite general principles on transparency, performance-based payments, on the stratification, as I mentioned. But one very important is that they need to take account of previous contractual arrangements uh, and need to be flexible enough for new contractual uh, arrangements to be, um, to be decided at subnational level. And there's also provision for exempt payments. So what are the critical issues in the design of this program at the moment? Well, one of it is, um, is that, referring to that uh, scheme I, I described earlier, um, there is a strong need to assess the costs and the benefits for each of the stakeholders of this program to ensure that the costs are being met before uh, the, the, the revenues um, that would potentially um, come from the, the carbon fund or other sources be distributed. Uh, and this has strong implications in case, for example, of underperformance of the program. If you don't meet your objectives, well, how do you distribute the costs? Who do you co whose costs do you cover first? Do you privilege local communities? Do you privilege your investor? Do you privilege the state? Um, that's, that these, are very, these are very strong uh, equity uh, implications in, in, in those questions. As this is a jurisdictional program and not just a project-based initiative, there's a number of considerations also that need to be given to uh, all the enabling conditions for it to, to perform. And this, is, this has um, a lot to do with potential support for the state to, uh, to to uh, actually implement its policies and, and reinforce its forest control, etc. So how do you balance between rewarding your individual uh, activities and, 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 uh, and performance uh, with actually financing those, enable, those enabling activities? And as I mentioned, uh, there are already uh, some uh, Red Plus projects in the field which are generating credits uh, and which have uh, contractual uh, arrangements existing with the state and these need to be accounted for and integrated within the program. So that's, that's quite complicated. Another um, uh, way of looking at benefit sharing uh, and uh, another issue is linked to how you channel those benefits um, to the communities. And in the Republic of Congo, we're currently um, uh, doing some work uh, to look at uh, local development funds and how those funds can, could pot potentially play a role in, uh, in Red Plus development. So the Republic of Congo has quite a, um, an interesting experience uh, in, in, in having set up um, local, um, uh, local organizations and, and, and local mechanisms to share benefits uh, and, and most importantly in the forest sector. Um, as, in, as in the DRC, actually, um, the concessionaires are, are um, tied by some uh, social, um, uh, social implications and they have to uh, dedicate part of the, their being taxed, basically, on their, on their uh, production to, uh, um, to allocate money to local development funds, which are then financing micro-projects uh, at the community level. So these funds are known to be quite uh, participative and, and quite interesting also in, the, in, it, in their institutional arrangements. Um, but there's a, quite a lot of difference between uh, an imbalance within the country and within the way they are being uh, implemented. There's a big opportunity uh, in, in this existing experience because they, they offer really a, a very interesting um, model for benefit sharing. Um, and they're, they're owned by the local people, so that's, that's, uh, that's very important. But some of the challenges that are implicated um, uh, with these mechanisms is that the transaction costs are e extremely high. Um, by trying to integrate as many stakeholders as possible, um, there's actually a lot of costs which are uh, linked to org the organization of meetings, uh, the payments of per diems, etc., uh, which are sort of eating up <laughs> most of the funds, actually, in some cases. Um, and there's uh, some very strong need in, as well in terms of reinforcing uh, accountability and, and financial uh, management of, uh, of those funds. And most importantly as well, as we mentioned earlier, these funds are not at all performance-based. 
they are just a compensation mechanism. So there's, there's still some, some way to go before um, th that uh, uh, performance-based um, um, element could be potentially integrated into their work. So just to conclude a few lessons from, from, from those two experiences. One, one of the key messages I'd like to, to, to leave you with is that we need to keep things simple and manage expectations. Um, as I mentioned, it's very important uh, to move away from the, um, when, when talking about red, to move away from maybe the traditional conservative um, forest concession or forest industry ways of looking at uh, compensation of, uh, of local communities, but do a real assessment of uh, what are the costs and the benefits for each of the stakeholders. Manage transaction costs because these actually eat up all the, 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 the carbon rent. So there needs to be clear messages as to what are the real expectations in terms of revenues that could be, uh, that could be uh, shared between the different uh, stakeholders. Obviously, the, the arrangements need to be clear and, and transparent. And they need to build uh, to the extent possible on existing mechanisms such as the local development fund in, in Congo that I've been talking about. And finally, um, there needs to be a, a balance between equity and performance. Um, now moving to jurisdictional or even national Red Plus approaches, um, there really needs to be this balance to be struck between the enabling conditions and, and the actual uh, reward of, uh, of activities. And strong safeguards need to be put in place to provide confidence uh, to the stakeholders. And that includes, for example, uh, including these beneficiary arrangements within the legal framework, or at least some of the safeguards and guidelines that are linked to them. Um, putting in place complaint mechanisms, of course, um, to, provide, to ensure the accountability. And uh, ensuring that any of the, those mechanisms that are be, being put into place, and it's been already covered quite a lot by, by the colleagues, uh, are based on, uh, on, on informed consent and, uh, and consultation. I'm ending there. Sorry for being, being a bit long. <laughs> Thank you very much.